This is Larry Jordan, the host of the Digital Production Buzz. The following interview is an excerpt from a recent program. To hear the entire program, visit digitalproductionbuzz.com. We've had a chance to look at media in the UK from two perspectives. One is trade shows and the other is publishing. But now I want to go into the industry itself. And I want you to meet Rex Palmer, who is a lighting cameraman, has been working freelance in the UK for, well, let's just say more than a year or two. Hello, Rex, good to have you with us. Good to be here. How would you describe your background? What have you done? Well, I started work at the BBC many years ago uh, as a trainee cameraman. And one of the first programs that uh, was my pleasure to work on, or to assist on, perhaps I should say, was Doctor Who, which I think is oh my seen by many people around the world. <laughs> so that, that was quite an experience, working on the first ever Doctor Who, which of course was shot in, in black and white. And the cameras we had in those days were rather large and heavy and difficult to move around. So they needed uh, new young trainees like me to help move the cables so they didn't make noise as they moved around the studio. Now you describe yourself as a lighting cameraman which is a term that we don't use in the States. What does right. that mean? That means that I, I can also light my own work. Would you consider yourself a director of photography? Uh, that is a term that in the UK is used by film cameramen specifically. Uh, the term for television has always been lighting cameraman, just to distinguish the fact that the actual work we do is slightly different. Do you prefer the lighting part of it or the camera part of it? Uh, nowadays, the camera part of it. How come? Uh, that's what I've ended up doing for the last 20 years. I've been actually working on covering the Formula One championship all over the world. What are some of the projects you've worked on recently? Uh, well, that, that's the main one that I've been doing, I'd say, for the last 20 years. Before that, all sorts of sports in the UK. Um, started off in the studios in London with the BBC. Uh, and did all sorts of studio programs, whether it be light entertainment, like uh, Morecambe and Wise, or doing the sports linking for the, the weekend sports shows, or doing drama, the various different plays for today. We had a series called Play for Today back in those days. Well, with drama, drama's got a script and we're following along what's going on. Sports that, is about as unscripted as it gets. This is true. So it's what a is, different discipline, yes. What's, what's the challenge? How do you manage to keep up with sport? <coughs> uh, you rely a lot on the director, obviously. Um, whereas in a studio where, you, where you're doing a scripted program, you've got a, a, on your, each cameraman has a list on his camera of all the shots that he's going to be taking with the shot description and position where it's got to be, whether it's a wide shot, tight shot, and so on. But when you're doing sports, you rely on, first of all, knowing the role of the particular camera that you might be doing. For example, Wimbledon tennis. Doing Wimbledon tennis, the, the standard when I started was to have four cameras around the court. We'd have the high wide shot, which was the overall picture of the court. And then you'd have a, a close up over the server's shoulder from the same end as the high wide, and two side cameras looking at the players at each end. So you had to understand the role that each of those cameras did, and the director would expect you to know what you had to do at any given time. He would, of course, get you to change things. Uh, he'd not call for a close-up or for a wider shot or, or whatever, so you, you were constantly being guided by the director as to what shot he wanted to use next. Although the format, you, you understood the format, so you knew more or less what was expected of you. Of all the sports you cover, which one do you have the most fun with? Um, I did enjoy doing Wimbledon, but then you also got to do many of the Open Golf Championships as well different parts of the country so and, and seeing the the scenery there because they were always nearly always seaside courses so you, you got to you know, enjoy nice weather so often it was rather breezy and, <laughs> and if you were doing a camera up on a on a, a tower on a platform um, the people used to look at you very strangely because you'd be wearing a big heavy coat and and maybe a hat as well uh, and the people on the ground down around you would be in their bikinis. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
you describe yourself as a freelance rather than staff. Is yes. most of the work freelance these days or is most of the work staff? No, most of the work now, especially in the UK, is freelance. And I was staff cameraman when I was at the BBC, obviously because you're working in the studios and then on outside broadcasts, you were a staff and you worked with a crew of maybe half a dozen other people, <laughs> um, along with you know, the, the sound men, the engineers, making sure the pictures look right and all that sort of thing. And you went round as a team. But, but <clears throat> once that stops, you, you go freelance, then you're out on your own, you've got to find your own work. So that's the difference. What, what part of the industry is, is shooting these days? Because in the States, we're seeing that some industries are sort of cutting back and some outlets are increasing. Where's the market? What's the jobs today? Uh, live television is still live television. <laughs> you can't get around that. So yeah, that, that, it is still there. The, the, the difficulty is knowing the right people that will give you the sort of work that you want to do. And that's where it be life becomes a bit more difficult. If you want to specialize in a particular thing, you, you've got to, first of all, somehow get a name for, you, for doing that sort of work, and then get, so you get known, and then the work will then come to you. We're seeing at the show, we're seeing a lot of robotic cameras, point right. and zoom cameras, which are, which are replacing the traditional camera operator. Have they made much of an impact in terms of the work that you've been doing? Not really, not, not, certainly not in, in something like uh, major sports, because you can't have too many robotic cameras which then might fail and fall on the players, for example. So, no, you don't get it so much. Um, but the, the thing that really has changed is, is the size of the cameras getting smaller and the size of the lenses getting bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so you now get on, on, uh, on most sports, you've got large zoom lenses, which can be up to 100 to 1 range, which is phenomenal. Unbelievable. And, and w when you're doing something like that, obviously you need some very stable camera mountings, because you don't want to be wobbling about trying to take a close-up of a car that's at the other end of the pit lane. <laughs> well, I do remember back when I was starting out, I was working with turret lenses, so we had to, yes. to shift from one, because we didn't have the zoom. That's exactly, and when the yeah, yeah. when the first zooms came out on the old RCA TK42s and TK43s, the camera and the pedestal and the lens weighed close to 1,000 pounds. This is true, absolutely, yeah. And getting that thing to start dollying was sure. a real challenge. Um, and that's where uh, one of our British companies, Vinton, came into their own making superb camera pedestals, which would balance the camera and you could change the height and change direction uh, all with one hand. Yep. So, we, we, which made the work of the, the studio cameraman so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that uh, I was dollying a camera at one point and I lost control of it and it crashed through the set. So I totally understand <laughs> what you mean. The talent was a little worried as the camera got a little bit too close. Exactly, <laughs> yes. When you, there's, you're at the end of your career. This is true. I, I mean, you've still got 30 or 40 years left, but you're at the end of the career. I don't think so. <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> what advice would you give to the kids that are starting out? What do they need to know to be a good camera person? <coughs> that is rather difficult nowadays because the only way that the camera trainees come into the business is through media colleges. And a lot of the people that go to media colleges think they want to be directors rather than actual camera operators. And the skills obviously are very different. But for, we're very lucky in England, or in Great Britain I should say, that we do have a lot of very good media colleges producing lots of very good potential cameramen. And part of the camera guild of which I am a member uh, is to encourage the media colleges to be involved in the training of the cameraman to do camera work, not just be a director. And there is an award scheme that, that, that is, runs in the UK where a, a particular, particular student at a particular college or university will get an award for being the best of that year's bunch. Now, you've mentioned the, the GTC, the Guild of Television okay. Cameramen, which is where you and I first met a couple years ago. Indeed. Tell me more about what the Guild 
does, is it just a union or is it doing, no, you've touched on more of it, but expand on that. It's not a union, that is the most, it is a guild, a camera guild. It is worldwide, although obviously it started and many of the members are based in the UK. But it's a worldwide organization. We have <coughs> agents all around the world. We have cameramen from Australia, China, America, of course, right across the States, Canada, all over the world. Though, as I say, the majority are, because of where it started, based in the UK. And it is, the role really is to try and maintain, and if possible, increase the standards of the camera work that the cameramen do all over the world. How do you do it? <laughs> I mean, because part of it is, part of it is training, it, it part indeed. of it is experience, it, exactly, but, and part of it is to 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 want to do better. Right. So all of that, how do you how do you build that? How do you foster well, that? One of the, one of the ways we do. I mean, obviously, um, one of the things we have is a members forum on online, where members can discuss with more experienced members problems they may be having doing a, trying to do a particular shot or uh, what's best sort of equipment to use for doing a particular thing. Uh, but one of the main things that the Guild does, which unfortunately is only in the UK, uh, is we hold workshops which can cover a wide range of things, lighting being an obvious one, um, new camera developments is another one, or actual experienced operators telling about how they got around solving particular problems. And this is a way people learn and then they obviously at all these things there's discussions afterwards and people talk to one another and learn from the interaction they have. I was just reflecting on how technology has changed over the years. From your point of view, how does technology affect storytelling? Uh, <laughs> In various ways, um, obviously one of the problem things is, is now that the cameras have got much, so much smaller and therefore so much lighter that it, it's easy to take a camera into a, into a small situation that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise have been able to do. But in terms of storytelling, <coughs> it depends what the director, assuming you're not doing a self shoot, what, what his ideas are as to how to achieve what he wants to do to tell the story. We're, can, we're there to advise and, and make us suggestions as to how it would be best done with maybe a change of a piece of equipment, maybe a particular using a particular camera mounting, uh, uh, a dolly that would give particular movement in a particular way. Uh, so that, that would be how we can assist the production to generate what they are trying to achieve with their end product. One of the, the cameras are smaller and they're cheaper and they do more. And one of the things I've often wondered is whether art grows out of the, the boundary between what you want to do and what you can do. And, and that, that now our cameras can do so much that it's sometimes it's hard to focus on what we want to do because there's so many different opportunities for us. Right. Are we better off now when everything does, seems to want to do everything? <laughs> or were we actually better off a while ago where we were more limited in forcing ourselves we, against boundaries? We were probably a little better off a few years ago when th there were limitations of what any one camera could do. And you would understand the limitations and you were able to work around it. Nowadays, the, <coughs> the cameras seem to be able to do everything, but then you suddenly find that actually the color balance is wrong. Uh, or the light changes and it still doesn't look right. So there's, there's two, in a sense, there are almost too many variables now to keep it under control, especially if you're doing a multi-camera shoot. If you're doing a multi-camera shoot, you want to make sure that all the cameras looking at, say, a, a player on a football field or a baseball field in the States, um, that they all make the, 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 the person they're looking at look the same color not too pasty, not too dark, depending on, on what they are. Or, or that the clothes look the same. Sometimes with modern cameras, with the, the sensitivity of, of the way the tubes and the, the uh, chips are now designed, uh, with a red, green and blue sensor, they're very narrow peak sensors. And if you've then got stadium lighting, 
which is also LED, <laughs> the peaks are in slightly different places. So as you can get, although the player appears to be wearing red shorts when you're live looking at it, through the camera, it could suddenly appear to be a, a slight <laughs> shade of green. Or <laughs> that is a big problem. <laughs> In the time that we've got left, what advice would you give to somebody starting out to help them become better? Uh, try and get some experience with an experienced cameraman uh, it, as, as a helper, as a sort of d an assistant for him, because that way you can see how it should be done and l hopefully learn from that. And for people that want more information about the Guild, where can they go on the web? Go online. What's the web address? The web address is gtc.org.uk. That's gtc.org.uk. And Rex Palmer is a lighting cameraman freelance here in the UK. And Rex, thanks for joining us Thank today. you. Take care. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. To stay connected and receive updates from The Buzz, sign up for our free weekly newsletter now or you can learn more about us on our website. And thanks for watching The Digital Production Buzz.